net family properties that's dividing it's the equalization uh, claim proper that uh, is appropriate okay and what about another uh, comment I believe you feel um, strongly about rightly so on the definition section of the precedent at the bar admission course what comments do you have on that um, if you turn to page C3 sorry we're going to do a little flipping here today but uh, and, and it also uh, quite surprises me how, how many comments we all seem to have on this precedent material, which has uh, been so well used and published uh, uh, for a number of years. It's really quite amazing, uh, the number of comments. First of all, uh, and I think this is very important, uh, sub-item G, property, has a definition, means real or personal property event or any interest in such property, a different definition than property is defined in the Family Law Act. And to me, it's very important to be consistent with the Family Law Act, and I would prefer a definition in the, uh, any separation agreements being negotiated where uh, the consistency would be that property means or has the same meaning as used in the Family Law Act. I'll just leave it at that. There may be uh, issues that arise in the uh, future where uh, the definition used in the Family Law Act is a wider definition and then there'll be confusion interpreting in interpreting the agreement. There are two other terms that are not included in this precedent by way of definition, and it seems to me that it's appropriate to define the terms net family property and equalization claim. It may seem obvious, but uh, this precedent does not define those terms, and in those cases also, I think it's appropriate to, to just define them as having the same meaning as used in the Family Law Act. And then we'll get into less interpretation problems at a later date. All right, then uh, what about moving on to your paragraph on the um, dealing with the equalization pay payment um, or claim? How do you generally start that off, and what, uh, in general terms, do you put in that paragraph? Well, uh, we'll look at this in, in general terms. Uh, looking at page D95, uh, I begin my uh, paragraph um, in full and final settlement of the equalization claim that either party may have against the other pursuant to Part 1 of the Family Law Act the parties acknowledge and agree as follows. Now that's a general preamble into dealing, and then we go for a number of pages where we clearly identify that in dealing with each specific group of uh, type of property, it is part of the uh, equalization claim. Um, and I don't, I, I won't comment on, it, on each one uh, specifically, but I just want you to see that the, uh, the formula of approach, I, I think it's appropriate to pull everything into one paragraph because now that's the way the Act operates, and uh, it seems appropriate to do so. Um, just as a practical matter, you mentioned that there, you could put your paragraphs dealing with the matrimonial home here. Would you be more inclined to separate the matrimonial home, say, if there was a lengthy term of exclusive possession and you wanted to deal with a lot of carrying charge uh, details in that? I think it might be appropriate with the matrimonial home to deal with it in two places, one under the equalization claim with respect to that part of your contract where you're dealing with proceeds of sale. But with respect to the many, many other issues that uh, Ruth Mesber uh, deals with, it might be appropriate because that doesn't deal technically with the equalization claim, the issues of exclusive possession, uh, carrying costs, taxes, you name it. So it, it might be appropriate to break out the matrimonial home clause into two, two portions. Okay, and, and then just before I move on to um, Stephen Grant, uh, w another issue that you have dealt with separately, but I wonder if you should comment on, is the transfer of us uh, RRSPs into a spousal RSP. What sorts of things um, might they also include that you haven't included, and what should they be careful about? Okay, if you look at page D97, uh, um, I've dealt there with a RRSP transfer clause, which is very common. Um, and of course, the, the fundamental object that we're trying to achieve by way of a rollover of RRSP is not to trigger any tax. Um, and this clause presumably, hopefully, does that. Um, some of the issues uh, that relate to the RRSP um, are that the husband, uh, assuming it's rollover from husband to wife, the husband may in fact have a number of different RRSP holdings. Some of them may be investments in different kinds of plans bearing different interest rates, and a number uh, of us haven't really looked carefully of, at that issue. If you just say that the husband will transfer 50% of the capital of his RRSP to the wife's name, to RRSP established in her name, it may give freedom to the husband to select those RRSPs that have the worst rate of return. So you might, 
it may not be, in fact, adequate just to uh, transfer 50 percent. You may have to do enough uh, homework and investigation to find out and make sure that your client, in fact, is going to get uh, not only half the capital value, but half of the kinds of RRSP that are producing, at least on the average, the average rate of return. Another uh, issue uh, has to do with because uh, separation agreements are often negotiated a number of years or maybe a couple of years following separation, the payment and transfer, of course, is effective as of the valuation date, so there is an issue as to whether having decided what half the capital was as the date of uh, valuation in the RRSP, should there be an interest component uh, paid on the uh, transfer sum also. And uh, in fact, it's very appropriate. Otherwise, your client, if you're on the receiving end, is receiving half of the capital that's a couple of years old, so that there should be an adjustment uh, in that regard. And one other question was, uh, I think we talked about, was timing of the <coughs> transfer. Um, the issue of timing, um, and this may relate uh, to some other uh, items of property that may be transferred uh, pursuant to a separation agreement, must the transfer be made within a certain time period? Obviously, it's in the interest of both parties to get the deal done and the transfers of property made. And I guess one issue may be that uh, you may even, if the transfer isn't made within six uh, years of the date of your contract, you may have even lost the rights as a question of contract to sue to compel uh, compliance and transfer. Um, so that's something uh, to keep in mind. Ruth, did you want to comment on the RSPs? Yeah, a, a couple of things to keep in mind are that in order to make the transfer tax-free, have it happen on a tax-free rollover basis, it's necessary to do certain filings with Revenue Canada. The form that needs to be filed is T2220. And the requirement is that you must file Form T2220 together with a copy of the separation agreement within 30 days of the transfer being made. And that's the document that creates the tax-free rollover treatment of the transfer. So that's crucial. Um, and to pick up on what Stephen was saying about the problems with picking and choosing assets from self-directed RRSPs, if you're acting for the transferee, you may well want to insist on the transfer being cash. Uh, you can't do much better than cash. And then the transferee can pick and choose as to whether he or she wishes to have um, blue chip investments, a self-directed RRSP, a mutual fund RRSP, or whatever but it's an important thing to consider. Ruth, could I just ask uh, mm -hmm. a question to clarify that because I don't think as a question of practice that's well known. Don't ask her whether you lose the tax uh, write-off if you don't file within 30 days. Don't ask yeah, her. No, I won't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, pretty troublesome. Uh, Ruth, uh, if the wife already has an RRSP established, mm -hmm. can you just roll over without this form and filing the no, agreement? No, you have to file the form and file the agreement. And the wording... I like to have the have particulars of the wife or the transferee's RRSP according to plan number um, so that the agreement can say specifically that there will be a transfer from husband's RRSP, say with Canada Trust number, blah, 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 going into <coughs> wife's RRSP with Sun Life number, whatever it is. And on the form, I finally saw one of these forms not long ago, which is why I know about it. it. It has places not only for the transferor to fill in particulars of the RRSP, but also for the trustee of the plan to fill in the details of uh, from his plan to her plan, and they have to sign as well, and then it all gets filed with revenue. <coughs> okay, moving right along to uh, Stephen Grant and his uh, estate problems. Uh, Stephen's dealt with life insurance and estates. Um, and one of the uh, questions that is, uh, I've sometimes thought about myself, um, mainly because I get a lot of phone calls from life insurance agents, I think, is um, do you ever think about sending your specific clauses or t um, having your client review the clauses with a uh, life insurance uh, insurance agent to make sure that the clause is going to meet their needs in the future, Stephen? Well, it may be a good idea, but uh, I don't. I have an inveterate, uh, morbid fear of insurance agents, and um, so I try to talk to them as little as I can, but it, it may very well be worthwhile. They, they, the other thing about them is that they start talking about 
uh, annuity this or wrap around that, and uh, it, it's uh, beyond me. So I don't, but it probably is a good idea. Um, also on uh, seeking other experts' advice, um, how do you figure out uh, what the face amount should be? Say, for instance, <coughs> if they have to purchase a new plan. I mean, it's the one thing if they have a plan, but what about um, trying to figure out what the face amount should be? Well, there, there seem to be two ways to do this. One is the, the simple way, which is what I try to do, and that that's, uh, and it's, it works okay, particularly for children, is that you add up the amounts that are that the other spouse is obliged to pay over the term of the uh, payments and try to get uh, as much insurance as possible to cover that. Now obviously that's not realistic and reasonable. The other way and probably the preferred way is to take those amounts to the best that you can ascertain them. For example, uh, $1,000 a month for X number of years and and capitalize those uh, values and take a policy that would allow the other spouse to buy an annuity at the time that the obligation uh, um, crystallized and uh, use that amount in the policy. Uh, what about a um, declining term policy? I actually think declining term policies, especially when uh, when it's child support only are very uh, useful type policies. Do, do you know what they are? They're, they're term policies that allow for the insured person to pay to pay less money generally, but they have a face amount that gets reduced as each year of the policy goes on and therefore and thereby costs the spouse less money as the policy uh, matures, but also you're covering less of a risk, so it makes a whole lot of sense, I think. Okay, and uh, another uh, uh, area uh, that we are asked about, and I think um, dealing with the precedent itself in the materials, Stephen, uh, what about the payee spouse becoming an owner of the policy? Well, if it's a if it's a private policy, I think that's uh, realistic to do. If it's a, a policy through employment, I think it's impossible to do. Now, it makes it, to me it makes where where you can do it. Uh, to have the other spouse, the, the spouse to whom the benefit is going, to own the policy because that spouse can then be, be assured that payments, premiums, uh, will be made. And you can indeed, be, or you may be able to build that amount right into uh, to support payments. I think you're always at some risk if, um, if the policy is not owned by the spouse that's, that is likely to receive the benefit. Um, what kind of a clause could we put in our agreement to protect a payee spouse if it is an employer plan and um, they leave their employment? Is there anything you can include? Uh, I think you, you can include the clause that, that is uh, in, the, uh, in the precedent. My, the precedents that I've been reviewing are What on, page are you at on, for those? I'm going to say they're on D77 and following. There's a clause that tries to do this. I, I think, though, at some point it becomes problematic in this respect, let's say that um, a spouse is employed and has a policy of insurance through employment and either gets fired or leaves for, for uh, leaves the employment for bona fide reasons and maybe is 45, 50, 55, that age. I think that person, <coughs> if he or she goes to an employer that does not have a, does not have an insurance plan through, um, through employment, maybe up the creek in, in obtaining an, a, a replacement policy. I think that it's that, that much as you want to say that uh, say that that spouse has an obligation to do it. I think at some point it becomes problematic to do medically uh, just just in, on the question of insurability, and uh, that spouse may or may not be able to, to obtain replacement coverage or obtain replacement coverage at a at a cost that isn't uh, you know, outlandish in, in terms of the uh, risk. So you could provide for something to use their best efforts? Yes, so, but I, again, I'm not sure what, what efficacy that kind of clause has. And you, you, try, to, you try to cover it, and uh, I think you have to cover it in a way that allows for the, the insured spouse uh, to make reasonable efforts, but, and yet um, recognize that uh, it may not ultimately be possible. The other thing is I, I think that the spouse has to have lost the policy in the first place for bona fide reasons. They just can't quit the job and say, forget it. But there have to be bona fide reasons for it. Uh, okay, another thing that we usually find in our separation agreements, and, and I'm wondering whether these conflict, you deal with it a bit in your uh, paper, is um, we often say that the, um, if the policy is in effect, it'll be a first charge on the estate. We leave life insurance to cover support, and then we have a general clause that makes support payments binding on the estate. 
And I'm wondering, do we, does the person, the payee, get double? No, I, I don't think so. I, I do think, though, that in, in this respect, that you have to be careful about the, the interaction of two clauses. One is the uh, support, whether it's spousal or, or child support. You have to be careful about what you say in that clause and what you say in the insurance clause. In the, in the support clause, there, there are conditions and, and terms that uh, eliminate that support altogether, and one of them is the death of, of one or both of the spouses. That could be in conflict, or it, it could be problematic when you come to consider the insurance clause later, and all I say about that is that you have to be careful when you're drafting both of them. If you want the insurance to, to, to cover the uh, death of the pay, uh, payor spouse, I don't think it, that it's wrong to, to, to say in the support clause that support will be payable uh, until that spouse's death. But the wording of it, however, has to be clear when, when you say it. So that the clause that's in the, that's in the agreement or that's in the general bar ad uh, precedent that some of us use is uh, item 7 on page D77. It says, if the husband dies without this insurance in effect, his obligation to pay support pursuant to this agreement will survive his death, death notwithstanding paragraph X. That paragraph is the one that says that at the spouse's death, he no longer has to pay. So what you're, what you're doing is telling the other spouse, or the court eventually, or the, or the, um, the uh, executors, that this insurance is designed to replace uh, support. And I think you have to be careful not to allow for double payment or not to, or to make sure that there is some payment there. And I think it's, it's important to be clear about what your insurance is, is designed to do. Mostly, I think it's designed to replace support payment if a spouse dies for the rest of the term. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, Ruth, going back to the matrimonial home, uh, if we've got a lengthy a term of exclusive possession in this and the property is in one spouse's name alone alone is there anything that we can do to protect them any clause we could put in the agreement well it's a it's a tricky kind of situation um, what we tend to forget is that the part two rights under the family law act that give a spouse the right to concur in the sale of the property or to any refinancing those part two rights exist only as long as the parties are spouses. So that if there is a divorce, those rights are extinguished. Well, what does that mean? Um, normally it doesn't really mean anything. Unless you have a situation where there is a matrimonial home, say it's in the name of the wife alone, she has a period of exclusive possession of five or six years, and you can anticipate that during that period of time there will be a divorce. Well, what impact does that have on the husband? A very big one. Technically, what that does is it allows the wife to sell the house or remortgage it without her husband's consent. And what you need to do to protect against that simple solution is put the house into both their names, put it into tenancy in common. Um, if that's not possible for whatever reason, tax planning or whatever, what is important is to have something in the agreement that provides for registration of the agreement on title to the property to give a prospective purchaser notice of the husband's interest in the property. I'm assuming on these facts that when the property is sold, even though it's in the wife's name, the husband will share in the proceeds of sale. And you would also want your agreement to say that the wife could not unilaterally mortgage the property and again, the agreement should be registered on title so that a mortgagee or a prospective purchaser has actual notice of those restrictions and of the husband's interest. It's a situation that arises fairly rarely, but it's one that you should be aware of. Uh, what about if, again, if you have an uh, exclusive possession, even if it's for a short time, how specific are you usually in your separation agreements dealing with what, how the property is going to be dealt with at the termination of the exclusive possession? Um, do you mean in the sense of how the proceeds are to be divided? Or, or who, how it's going to be sold? Well, it depends. Sometimes I'm fairly vague and sometimes I'm specific. Uh, I think it's better to be specific in terms of how a listing price is going to be arrived at. I mean, you can do it one of two ways. You can say the house will be <coughs> sold and so on and so forth and then have a basket clause that says if the parties can't agree, either one of them can apply to court for partition and sale and division of the proceeds in accordance with the agreement. It's easy to 
uh, specify what happens with the proceeds of sale. The kicker is how the property is to be sold. Often I'll say if the parties can't agree on the method in terms of sale within 30 days of the triggering event that's supposed to trigger the sale, then either one of them can go to court. You may want to put in your own mechanism that says the listing price is what the parties agree on. If they can't agree, then a single appraiser, if they can't agree on a single appraiser, then they each get an appraiser of their own who agree, and if the appraisers can't agree, they choose a third one, and so on and so forth until you finally get one. Um, but that's basically how you do it. I think it's also important to have a clause that says that the parties agree to accept the first reasonable offer that comes in. What about if there happen to be any arrears, uh, for instance, at the time of the sale by the party that's been in exclusive possession or um, uh, repairs or the house isn't in good condition? What kind of clauses have you ever put in an agreement to prevent the person out of exclusive possession from suffering? Well, first of all, the agreement should specifically provide as to who does what in terms of cost while the period of exclusive possession is going on. And it's helpful to think in terms of ongoing carrying costs as one category and then extraordinary expenses such as repairs, refurbishment, roof falls in. Uh, and within that category, you'll want to differentiate between appliances contents kind of repairs and repairs and renovations to the property itself. And normally what I do is I have the carrying cost, mortgage taxes, utilities, um, what that type of thing, paid for by the party in possession and some mechanism for sharing in some fashion the other kinds of expenses, the repairs and maintenance, whether it's they share equally everything over a certain dollar value with a proviso that the party in possession can't unilaterally do all of this stuff. For, ex for example, do a $50,000 renovation to the kitchen and then go to the party out of possession and say, well, dear, I just did this. I pay the first 500 and we share the, the balance equally. So that there has to be some protection in the agreement itself for the party out of possession to have the right to agree to any major repairs, unless it's an emergency like um, the roof literally falling in. Uh, and, that, and I think you have to be careful, too, about insurance and make sure that there is a proviso in the agreement that obliges the party in possession to keep the insurance current. And uh, w one last question in this area. Do you think it's necessary to, s to deal with the issue of occupation rent uh, when we've already agreed to put in uh, exclusive possession uh, terms? I usually do. I usually say that, let's say, the wife may remain in exclusive possession of the matrimonial home without payment to the husband of occupation rent until something occurs and then you have your list of <coughs> triggering events. You can't be wrong by putting it in and it, it just eliminates one potential problem. Um, okay, on the, um, going back on the net family property uh, or equalization claim, as Stephen uh, likes to call it, um, one of our uh, great concerns these days is dealing with pensions, and um, I'll deal with them in two issues. One is the Canada Pension Plan, which Stephen Smart has the definitive answer on whether or not we can release claims to CPP credits, and the other then will go on to deal with um, private pensions. What about the Canada Pension Plan uh, credits, Stephen? What's the latest on that? Okay, there is a latest. Um, and I think it's important, first of all, to, uh, to turn to page C13. That's uh, where the uh, standard release clause for Canada Pension uh, is concerned. And there was a long, hard and fight to get that clause uh, recognized as a valid clause. You remember we started uh, in this area of Canada Pension with the legislation providing for a statutory uh, division of uh, unadjusted, unadjusted pensionable earnings. Uh, but the, uh, the, the pension board, uh, in fact, was disallowing releases. And a number of cases went through the uh, Federal Court of Appeal, ultimately acknowledging when you did have a general release clause, uh, that would bind the minister in any application made by a spouse. If you just strike out that clause, because that won't work anymore, um, there's, uh, that clause is, is inadequate, and I think it's fairly standardly used, so I think we've all got to uh, get that out of our system and out of our word processors. If you turn to page now, uh, D100, I've uh, included uh, an alternate clause, uh, either permitting uh, the equalization of Canada pension plan uh, to be made 
or the alternative one at the bottom part of that page where in fact there, there is a release. Now, the significance, and I think it's just important and it's something you should pass on to your fellow practitioners uh, because this is uh, totally a misunderstood area. Uh, sub 2 of section 53.4 of the uh, Canada Pension Plan legislation reads, and this is why we stroked out that other clause, it says, except as provided in subsection 3, where a spousal agreement was entered into or a court order was made on or after June 4th, even a court order, uh, the provisions of that spousal agreement or court order are not binding on the minister for the purpose of a division of unadjusted uh, pensionable earnings under sections 53, 2, and uh, 3. So you cannot use general language, and very specifically what you've got to use is contained in subsection 3 of section 53.4, uh, and it refers to spousal agreements entered into on or after June 4, 86, contains a provision that expressly mentions this act, so you've got to have the referral reference to the act in, the set in your paragraph, and indicates the intention of the spouses or former spouses that there be no division of unadjustable pensionable earnings under 53.2 or 53. Then uh, the minister shall not make a division under this section. So. That's why the, the uh, clause is very short, but it does refer to the section number, it refers to the act, and it refers to the intention of the parties. I'm sorry, I may, misunder, have, under, may, may have misunderstood. May have, so you're cold, uh, yeah, Stephen. Cold. Uh, why do you say in here, or did I miss this, that the parties intend to agree? Why don't you just say that the parties agree? I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. because an agreement is an intention. <clears throat> okay. Um, the, the word in so the act is intention, however. <laughs> he was being cautious. Yeah. Um, and, and you also put in there if they do plan to divide them, you have that as an alternative clause, don't Yes, you? I have uh, the upper clause, in fact, is just a confirmation. It may be part of the equalization claim that that is an asset that should be divided. And so it just provides that uh, there will be cooperation and any necessary consent will be given by the uh, spouse <coughs> that may be required. Um, uh, probably even more scary than our CPP clauses is our private pension clauses. And um, Stevens attempted to give some uh, alternative clauses dealing with private pensions um, without getting in all to the substantive issues of how pensions can be divided. Uh, perhaps, Stephen, you could just draw our attention to how your precedents uh, have tried to deal with this issue. Yes, I'd like to uh, comment by saying I, I've put three different uh, ideas down on paper as to how to deal with private pensions. I'm far from satisfied uh, that we've come up with the right answer. Obviously the courts are struggling with it and the legislation is struggling with this issue because the problem is there has to be a valuation of pension interests within the Family Law Act and the issue is how do you then express that in terms of uh, either a payment now or a future payment. And uh, I think we can anticipate in the next year to see some new legislation permitting uh, uh, private pension plans to permit some form of division to occur rather than the wait and see rule. Uh, I have uh, put forward uh, uh, three alternatives and I should say uh, well we have a number of uh, uh, people practicing family law at our firm uh, and we have a, even a pension department. Uh, there is certainly a, a real degree of concern and uncertainty as to what really is the appropriate manner uh, to deal with this issue. But if I can refer you to page D98, um, the first uh, clause really is uh, a single, we'll call it a single payment. In other words, there's some attempt by the parties to value what the interest is currently um, of the uh, value of, in this case, the husband's pension uh, holdings and that clause describes how much he's contributed, it, how much the company has contributed, <coughs> talks about it being a vested uh, pension, and then uh, the paragraph uh, is, uh, the husband agrees forthwith upon execution of this agreement to cause to be paid to the wife absolutely the sum of Z dollars in full and final satisfaction of the wife's entitlement to any value in this pension fund. Now, that's one approach. Um, it's a very difficult issue. You're going to need to get an actuary to assist you to find uh, current value of uh, what has been contributed into uh, a pension fund. Alternatively, the first alternative um, is al something along the lines, and, and again, I, I, I caution people and I ask everybody to think this out carefully, uh, his or herself, because it's a very difficult issue to deal with. But the concept in the first alternative is to uh, have a, a portion of the funds that have been contributed to the fund to date to be held in trust for uh, the wife 
so that at the point in time that the monies are then payable, in other words, when the husband goes on pension, either at an early date or at, uh, mature, at a mature date, uh, the wife will then receive a percentage of the pension that the husband will then be paid. The third alternative is what I'd call a cop-out, but I've done it. Um, and that's uh, because I think of the uncertainty in the area. And uh, it's the husband agrees to have his pension benefits, or it could be the agreement the husband and the wife agree to jointly uh, engage uh, uh, someone to uh, value the pension benefits, standing to his credit as of the date of separation, valued by, well, there it is, mutually agreed appraiser or actuarial expert. The parties agree to abide by the recommendations of such appraiser or expert as to how best the said pension benefits acquired or stand to the benefit of the husband's account up to the date of separation can best be equalized at this time. Uh, in doing such calculation, an interest adjustment shall be made to such figure from the date of separation to the date of payment. It's that issue of the time delay between the date of separation and finalization of that issue. Um, I, I put it forward. It is a bit of a cop-out, but it does, in fact, uh, reach the uh, principle that that asset will be looked at by an expert of value ascribed and the best, me best method, which may differ from the kind of pension that you're talking about. So. Uh, th there's no one answer in this field and we're, I'm finding I'm getting some extremely surprising results by engaging an expert to look at pensions. Sometimes I think my husband is going to be creamed, he has, must have the biggest pension in the world, but don't ask me how they do it. It comes back, the wife who's only worked a few years with the school board ends up with a much bigger uh, pension, pension contribution than the husband who's been paying in for years and has a much higher income. It's a strange area. I uh, think we need expert help, and uh, it's far from clear. Just, just on that point, uh, for, for your information, the, the, uh, we'll, and we'll be discussing this, I think, on Tuesday night at the family law meeting, but uh, you might look at, just on the pension area, two cases called, one's called Humphreys, and the other is um, called... Marsham. Marsham. Thank you. Um, and picking up from those two cases, tax rears its ugly head again. Um, both Humphreys and Marsham on the pension issues do discount the actuarial value given for the pensions for income tax. And the approach taken is that they looked at the husband's average tax rate for the prior three years. I mean, it's quite arbitrary. There's no logic to this because you don't know what his, what his rate is going to be at the time that he retires. So they take an average for the last three years or so. and discount the actuarial value by that tax rate. And you'll find that in a lot of the valuations that you get from the actuaries that there will be a note right in there in the valuation saying, we have not discounted for income tax. So that's something to keep in mind. In, in Marsham, uh, <laughs> Mr. Justice Walsh, at the end of his judgment, has a, a two pages of direction. And I, I must compliment Stephen Smart for basically taking those two pages of directions as to how this pension will be divided at the time that it becomes payable and, and putting them into clauses that are, that are readable and uh, understandable. One of the <coughs> issues, too, that comes up on the uh, pension division, and uh, this is not a top, uh, seminar on pensions, but I think it's important in our separation agreements, um, given what Phil has told us, dealing with uh, the clause that um, Stephen has put in for dividing contributions, sometimes you'll find, and I'm sure you've found this, that the contributions are not necessarily the value of the pension, especially if the person is invested. Sometimes they can have incredible contributions, um, and the value that came back for me one time was practically half the value of the contributions that had been paid in. So. I thought I'd uh, just, in a, uh, there's some very tricky areas in the pension uh, uh, field. Uh, last week we were consulted by uh, a person who had signed an agreement where the wife um, had received half of the husband's then, half the value of the husband's then pension on, in the separation agreement. In other words, it had been equalized. Uh, the wife also, uh, the husband was obligated to pay support to the wife, and the husband was now taking retirement. And his question to us was, well, I've already divided my pension. It's my only income from now on. Surely I don't have to continue paying support. And uh, the opinion that we had to give him is not necessarily so. Um, you've divided your pension. True, that's a property question. That fits in within, within the equalization claim. That does not address the issue of support. And while the equities, you would think, might be on the side of the uh, husband in that case, it would be a question that the court would uh, look at. The, the agreement was silent on at an age uh, termination for the wife's payment. So there's some very interesting questions. 
Uh, I was uh, negotiating with Susan Lang one time, and she I don't think she ever lets anything slip by her, and she thought of that very issue. And uh, what she insisted on being inserted in the agreement was that uh, when the husband retired, the portion of his pension, uh, the portion of his income attributable to his pension that had already been capitalized and divided would not be considered as part of his income in, any, in him applying to vary. I thought it was brilliant at the time. I hated her that she had thought of it, but... It really does deal with the issue of trying to make sure that you don't get that the payee spouse doesn't get a double benefit from the pension income. Um, okay, another question, Stephen, in dealing with the uh, equalization claim. Uh, some of us in, uh, at our clients' uh, instructions don't get appraisals or we don't get exact valuations. Do you ever put a paragraph in the agreement that acknowledges this, that although there's been financial disclosure, uh, the parties have um, not obtained valuations of certain properties, etc.? Um, I don't think I ever have. I can see some merit in it. I think the merit may protect the lawyer as much as the client. Um, maybe that's a reason for doing it. Um, I think it's quite common that we negotiate agreements without uh, full appraisals and from a protection viewpoint there may be an advantage of highlighting that point but I'm not sure that it just does not, it, it may undo things too because are, do we have an agreement, is it based on values parties are satisfied with or doesn't it? And uh, so I have mixed feelings on the issue, I think that we can only do our best. I have my appraisals, my understanding of the facts, the other side has their understanding of the facts and very often we don't agree. Uh, again, on that line about disclosure, uh, do you ever consider attaching the stationer's NFP um, form to show exactly how that equalization uh, payment dollar value was arrived at? I don't, and I can see, I think I have the same uh, prejudice against attaching it. I can see the advantage, but the fact of the matter is, and we all know when we go off on pretrial conferences and we do our, each of our net family property statement calculation, they differ. And a separation agreement, after all, is a compromise and a settlement and it does not necessarily reflect uh, an agreement on values on all properties. So I think that it would be very hard to achieve consensus between two uh, spouses that they have come to an agreement that with respect to each property they have agreed on each value. Okay, um, Stephen, back to you and your uh, dead topics over there. Um, are you, are you, you with sure us? You gave, gave me the interesting ones, didn't you? Well, I knew you were going to be sick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, uh, what about on the estates? I think we'll leave our, uh, our panel this morning talking a bit about the estates. The precedent that is in the Bard Mission course is, is used quite uh, frequently. Um, what's, what's the matter with that basic precedent? You, you know, I, I, I saw this question. I, I'd like to know what you think the matter with it is, except for the fact that it's badly written. I, I think that uh, it has, the clause that uh, Nancy's talking about is at uh, page D83. Or, sorry, D81. <coughs> I think in, in this, as in all other things, I mean, it, it's, it's fun to critique this, and uh, I think we all tend to get very uh, nervous about uh, changing something that has supposedly been tried and, and uh, true, but uh, I think we all always have to, to look at new ways to, to say something. I think the problem in this... Um, particular clause is that it's not, it's not well drafted. It, it seems redundant and, and verbose, except as provided in this agreement. Well, I suppose what th that's allowing for is an option to provide some other binding item in your agreement uh, on the estate. And subject to any additional gifts, that, that clause is, uh, I, I never like subject to clauses in any event, but it's, uh, I suppose, allowing for one spouse to make um, gifts or bequests at death to the other spouse. I think that there is probably a way to to say that with uh, with the more clarity, like um, uh, what the, the spouses may leave to each other anything in a will, and uh, you go on from there. But apart from that, Nancy, I have to confess, I don't know what else is wrong with it. No, I, I, I didn't have a lot of things wrong with it either. I think that something is, that is in there that isn't in my... Um, uh, precedent or hasn't been until this moment. Uh, any will validly made after the date of this agreement. Most uh, of our precedents, I think, prior to this have just said any will. And um, uh, I think parties actually, even as recently as last week, I was asked, well, 
they don't realize that their wills could survive the separation agreement. There's some ambiguity about that, and um, putting it made validly made after this agreement makes that very clear. So. The, the other thing about it is that I think putting that clause in when you go and, and clients often ask about this, I find and they, they, when you have this in here or some form of this, it I think alerts you and the client perhaps to the necessity of uh, doing uh, doing a will in conjunction with or after you've, you've done a separation agreement. And what about um, the releases under the succession law? Anything that people should be um, aware of, particularly if it's uh, dealing with a support application for a dependent? Well, again, it's the, it's the same issue as I had mentioned before when we were dealing with insurance. It, it, it is a matter of making your agreement uh, fit the context that you're drafting it for and making it uh, making it not ambiguous. I think all that all that the releases are about in this, with respect to the succession law is you're trying to prohibit somebody from making a claim under the Succession Law Reform Act. But you, be, you, you better be careful that when you've drafted your support clause initially that it's, that it's clear and it can stand on its own and that it provides sufficiently for, uh, for your client and that your release, on the other hand, is again free from ambiguity. I think that's all that it's about. Anything else you want to tell us about death? No. I, I, I want to uh, thank my panel members this morning uh, for making us all feel a little uh, more uneasy about our uh, agreements. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And we'll see you back here this afternoon at uh, 1.30. Thank you. have your attention for a minute. Our, our next um, presenters are ready to begin and I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, Evelyn McGivney, who is a partner at Bastido Cooper and Shawstack. Evelyn specializes in tax law. Family. Family law. Or ta tax laws that pertains to family law. And next to Evelyn is George Denier, who is a tax partner at Thorne, Ernst & Winnie. And they will tell you all about everything you need to know about tax implications of domestic contracts. Thank you. I'm going to start. You'll note from the paper that what we've directed our attention to really is people who are married and cohabiting. We did not get into uh, a a lengthy dissertation on separated parties or people who are not married and, and are cohabiting. Those topics seem to come up and have been dealt with on a number of occasions. Uh, many of our clients, if in the people here do family law, are now interested in doing marriage contracts and they do those marriage contracts not with the expectation that they're going to separate. They do them with the expectation and the hope that they will continue to stay together. Uh, they want to protect assets that exist at the time of the marriage and maybe assets that is increase in value uh, of those assets and assets accumulated subsequent to the marriage. Most of them uh, may have a problem or two during the marriage. Many of them will separate, but many of them will not. And a lot of the people will take these marriage contracts and put them in the safe uh, with their wills and worry about it later. But there are some tax consequences that George and I will direct your attention to uh, that you should be aware of in negotiating your marriage contracts and at least advise the clients for two reasons. One, so they know when they have tax arising and two, so you're not found negligent at some later time when the tax consequences arise and you weren't aware of them. Now, the first topic that I am going to deal with is Section 73 rollovers. That is the automatic rollover between parties who are married uh, to each other. Now spouses are people of the opposite sex who are legally married to each other. Uh, otherwise you don't qualify as a spouse for this rollover within the meaning of the Income Tax Act. What happens on a transfer of property between parties who are married to each other is that there is an automatic rollover under Section 73 and that rollover uh, really to describe it is as if it didn't happen at all. It's as if the transfer has not taken place. There are no tax consequences immediately arising upon that transfer. Now that certainly is very helpful between spouses on certain occasions uh, and recognizes from the income tax perspective that the parties are really one entity so that the property can be transferred back and forth without any tax consequences on any number of occasions. You will notice that if you've done real estate, there's no land transfer tax or other tax consequences between 
uh, spouses when properties are transferring. Nothing has to be done when you are uh, going to have a rollover. It's automatic. Nothing has to be filed with the tax department. Uh, it's actually something that happens and the tax department probably doesn't even know about it until there are some later consequences. George will be dealing with those later consequences and, and that is the attribution rules. But people confuse this Section 73 rollover with the attribution rules. It is independent, although it is connected in some ways to the attribution rules. And you may elect out of the Section 73 rollover. The person who elects out of the Section 73 rollover is the person transferring the property. The recipient spouse has to sign nothing. Unlike the rollover elections, or rather the capital gains elections and attribution elections on separation, that we all see attached or appended to the end of a separation agreement, which has to be signed jointly by the parties. This one is signed by the transferor, and the reason for that is the transferor then has tax consequences. There are no tax consequences uh, on that transfer to the transferee. Um, why would your client want to elect out? Uh, there are a number of occasions in marriage contracts when there are transfers of property contemplated. One of those transfers may, for instance, be a principal residence. There are no tax consequences anyway uh, because of the exemption. So you may want to roll the property over to the other spouse and elect out because there's no tax payable in any event. And then at a later time, uh, if the property uh, is sold, uh, etc., then those consequences would be with respect uh, to the specific spouse that is holding the property. That is, if the uh, principal residence designation is changed. Now, if the husband wants to transfer property to the wife and the wife has a higher income tax bracket, uh, that may be another reason to elect out so that the transferring spouse, the husband, uh, pays the tax immediately at a lower tax bracket. That is a saving to the family and certainly is something to be considered when you're negotiating a marriage contract if there are transfers of property. Obviously, if you pay cash uh, as part of the consideration in a marriage contract, there are no tax consequences from cash other than foreign currency, as George pointed out to me earlier. Uh, if you give someone a $100,000 lump sum, uh, there's no election uh, out of that. There's no rollover in any sense because there are no tax consequences. Now, well, maybe... The, the concern with foreign currency might be that you simply don't have a sufficient cost base in the property and its value may be different. Now, where was I here? Oh, yes, the result of the um, rollover to the spouse is that the spouse receiving the property uh, is deemed to have taken the property at the same value that is the capital cost base, the adjusted cost base, the undepreciated capital cost, uh, with some exceptions I won't go into about classes, uh, that the transferor had. So at a later time, and George will uh, spend more time on this, if the property is then sold, it's as if the transferring spouse sold it. Uh, and the transferring spouse will then have the tax consequences. Now, part of the problem with these uh, elections out is that you have to be married at the time you roll the property over. If the parties are not married, you don't want that transaction to take place. So in the marriage contract, they, the transaction or the transfer should take place after the marriage. It's very important or there won't be a rollover. Secondly, the parties must be resident in Canada. And this is a common problem if people are married in the States and intending to become resident at a later time, they may be married but not resident. And if they're not resident, the transfer itself should not happen. Or again, there will not be the rollover uh, possibly in the exception. Now, there are some exceptions to that in, a, in later assuming residence in Canada. Uh, but you have to be very careful that the transfer takes place at the appropriate time and that there is an appropriate rollover. George will now deal with the uh, consequences of the attribution rules, that is, the capital gains and income uh, attribution between spouses. Thank you, Ellen. Just on another point, though, you, you, you mentioned that when you're dealing with these uh, rollovers uh, on property, you need do nothing. Uh, uh, I think what we have is firstly the technicalities of law, and then we have administrative practice. And, when you look at Section 73, there is a disposition of property, albeit that the disposition is for 
uh, your adjusted cost base so no gain arises. But I think technically there should be a disposition reported on a tax return, but practically uh, Revenue Canada does, does not administer the law on that basis. There may or may not always be a case where you want for some particular reason to make sure you have followed technicalities of law as opposed to practice and keep that in mind. I'll spend the next few moments and deal with what we call the attribution rules, having transferred property, what happens next. Our attribution rules are contained in sections 74.1 uh, through 74.5 of our Tax Act. And to say the least, they're not easily read. Um, they're very complicated. They came into legislation in May the 23rd of 1985 in response to what was then widespread abuse of the attribution rules and they were written quite, uh, uh, in quite detailed fashion. Uh, simply put, if I as a taxpayer transfer property to my spouse, then uh, uh, while I am resident in Canada and while we are married to one another, any income from that transferred property is attributed to me for tax purposes. Any loss is also attributed to me. And I've played a few games between husbands and wives where I've had a wife go out, uh, in the cases I'm thinking of, a wife went out and borrowed money, bought a rental property from the husband. The interest expense now exceeded the rental income and I allocated or attributed a loss back to the transfer or husband. Uh, so it's income or loss. Uh, it ceases when I cease as a transferor to be a resident in Canada it ceases when we are not husband and wife. The rules also on income attribution apply to what is called loan property, where I transfer property or I loan property. The Income Tax Act uses the word loaned, although I don't see lend in there, but I guess they're somewhat the same. Uh, money is property, so if I lend money and my spouse uses that money to acquire property, the income from the original transfer from property substituted for the original property all gets attributed back to me for tax purposes. The same is true of capital gains. Capital gains are dealt with separately, but I as the transferor, in the case of transferred property or loan property, am deemed to have the capital gain for tax purposes. That follows all the way through the Income Tax Act from the point of view that if I haven't used up my $100,000 capital gain exemption, that's the exemption that used to be 500, but as of uh, white paper uh, will, is now 100, except if there's shares of a certain type of corporation, then it's 500,000, or farm property is still 500,000. Um, I am deemed as the uh, uh, transfer or spouse to have that capital gain, and I can use my exemption. You will not find that where you have transferred property to a spouse that uh, income arises in the transferee spouse's hands, which can be sheltered by that person's capital gain exemption. These attribution rules will also apply not just to transfers between spouses, but also to transfers to minor children, or perhaps a niece and nephew as well. And uh, if you transfer property to a minor child, that is a child by definition under the age of 18 at the end of the taxation year, there will be an attribution of the income. There will not be an attribution of the capital gain, only of income in the case of minor children. The reason for that is there's no rollover of property transferred to a minor child. You have to treat it as a disposition at fair market value. The game that we play today is uh, with minor children is to transfer property to a child who's 15 years of age, uh, stick it into a three-year guaranteed investment certificate and wait until the child is then 18. Income now falls in, there's no attribution back because the child is then over the age of 17. Rules exist as well to uh, where trusts are used to ensure that there's an adequate attribution of income where I, instead of transferring directly to a spouse or to a minor child, I have transferred property to a spouse. I'm sorry, I've transferred property to a trust for the benefit of uh, those people. And I will simply direct your attention to the fact that uh, where I try to do this through a corporation, there are similar rules to impute income into my hands where I lend money to a corporation which my spouse might own. 
Having said all that and uh, given up hope, uh, there, there are a number of exceptions to the income attribution and the capital gain attribution rules. Um, those of you who like uh, making uh, uh, references to the Act, you can look at 74.5, it's your leisure. They contain all of the exceptions in there. The main exception to the attribution of income and capital gains is where property has been transferred and consideration of a fair market value amount equal to the value of the property transferred is paid. So if I sell property to a spouse for $100,000 and I re worth $100,000 and I receive back $100,000 cash, if the transferor spouse also makes an election not to have the rollover rules apply, then there is no attribution of that income or capital gain. Um, if debt forms part of the purchase consideration, then as long as the debt bears interest at a prescribed rate, rates are prescribed quarterly for income tax purposes, as long as the interest has been paid within 30 days following the end of a taxation year, then again there is no attribution of either income or capital gains. There is also not an attribution of income for a period during which spouses are living separate and apart by reason of a breakdown of their marriage. There's nothing that has to be done, it's just an automatic, um, the rules are just automatically not applied where you are living separate and apart by reason of breakdown in marriage. Now that's for income attribution. Yep. Where now it used to be uh, pursuant to a separation agreement or court order um, and that has now changed. So you're just separated, the, the marriage is broken down, then it automatically applies. So facts will determine. Where it is capital gain you're concerned with, and we differentiate uh, capital gain because it's a separate source of income. Uh, our four main income sources are employment, income, I'm sorry, employment, property, business, and capital gain. And it's very separate from income uh, or employment income. Capital gains can be attributed even while you are living separate and apart if you don't make a joint election. Both the transfer or transferee spouse must elect in the year in which they commence to live apart and be separated by reason of a breakdown in their marriage for the attribution of capital gains to cease. There is also not an, uh, an attribution of uh, certain RRSP payments, and we'll deal with that a little later on, though. The, the, the concept is simple, the rules are difficult, and uh, uh, be wary that if you're transferring property, the tax doesn't necessarily follow to the transferee spouse. The next topic, which is one dear to all of our hearts, since most of us don't have pension plans, is the RRSP contribution between spouses. Now it's very common in a marriage contract to have one party agree to contribute over the number of years of the marriage uh, an amount to a spousal RRSP or to provide cash or equivalent property to uh, a particular spouse in order that that spouse be able to contribute to his or her own RRSP. Um, if cash is given and the spouse purchases his or her own RRSP, uh, a question arose, and I've asked George, and we think we have the answer. Uh, I give my husband $7,500 to put into an RRSP in his name. It is not a spousal RRSP. I have not made the contribution. I am not taking the deduction. My husband is. If he withdraws the money within three years, or if he withdraws the money at any time, and it therefore is included in his income, or would normally be, is that attributable back to me? George and I believe it is because it is, one, a transfer of property between myself and my husband, no immediate tax consequences. The money is put into an RRSP so it's sheltered, but if it's pulled back out again, then it becomes income in the spouse's hand, but is arising as a result of property transferred to the spouse during the marriage and would therefore be my income. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, I've seen a number of marriage contracts that have that requirement. As long as you know that that tax consequence may arise, that's okay and you can deal with it. The second kind of contribution, which is very common, is the spousal RRSP contribution. The first thing you have to know is that, again, the parties must be legally married. Um, they have to be resident in Canada. 
they don't necessarily have to be living together so that these spousal contributions have been made subsequent to the separation. The question then is how much can be contributed to a spousal plan? And the answer is uh, the same amount that the spouse could otherwise have contributed to his or her own plan. Now, that is not to say that the spouse can contribute to his plan uh, the $7,500 maximum and also to the spouse's plan for $15,000. It's a maximum of $7,500. So you first have to determine how much is the one party entitled to put into his own plan and then he can put it in his own plan, he can put it all in the spousal plan, or he can divide up between the two plans. Now, if you have a spouse who has an employer contributory pension, then the maximum the person can deduct is the $3,500 contribution to an RRSP, or 20% of earned income, whichever is less. However, if that person is also contributing to his or her pension plan, which is not uncommon, uh, then the amount may be even lower than the $3,500. It will be $3,500 minus the pension contributions or the 20% of earned income, whichever is less. With respect to um, a person who has no pension, uh, then you just look to 20% of the earned income. And if you have over, I believe it's 37,500 this year, 37,500 of income, then you're up at the $7,500 maximum, and you can divide that as you wish. Now, once you've contributed to your spousal plan, the person who makes the contribution is the person who deducts the contribution, not the spouse who is the owner of the plan. And if there is a withdrawal from that spousal plan within three years of the day or the year of the contribution, then there is attribution of the total amount back to the person who made the original contribution. Now, George and I have had an ongoing discussion for about six months about whether or not you can have a number of spousal plans. For instance, the husband would put $7,500 into one spousal plan and the wife would leave it there for three years, draw it out afterwards. My original uh, position, which George is weakening daily, uh, was that you could have four or five spousal plans and just draw out one that was more than three years old if you hadn't made any contributions. George, unfortunately, disagrees with me and wants to say something. Oh, my, I'll state my position now. Uh, yeah. my, my interpretation uh, of the legislation is simply that if, if I put money into Plan A, and uh, let's say three years from now uh, my, uh, my wife cashes in Plan A, you look to the contributions I've made in the year in which she cashed Plan A. To that plan or any other spousal plan, and if I've bought Plans B and C, you look to the contributions to all spousal plans in the year of cancellation and the two preceding years, and the lesser of my total contributions and the amount my spouse receives is what's attributed to me for tax purposes. Significant difference of opinion here, and uh, I guess if either of us could find something in writing to support our position, other than our own gut feel, we'd present it to you, but we can't. Now, one thing, a final point on RRSPs I want to make. I received a draft marriage contract about a month ago, and what it required was that my client, the husband, roll over to the wife within six months of the marriage 50% of his RRSP. Uh, that is not possible under the Income Tax Act. You do not roll over, nor can you roll over tax-free RRSPs between parties who are cohabiting. You can only do that when they're separated. Uh, it's certainly possible to enter into the two arrangements I said, that is cash, uh, for the spouse to put into his or her own RRSP or the spousal contributions, but you cannot roll over. Uh, if the husband were going to try to comply with that contract, he would end up having to cash his RRSP. Okay. Evelyn's paper emphasized it's her paper, not mine. Uh, I was busy, she wrote it, so she takes the credit. I wasn't busy. <laughs> <laughs> Next address is spousal trusts, and if you go back to Section 73 for a moment, where we were dealing with the transfer of property to a spouse, there is also a rollover provided where you transfer property to what we simply call spousal trusts. But uh, again, a spousal trust is a special type of trust. It is in particular a trust under which all of the income that arises is payable to the spouse during her or his lifetime 
and no person except the spouse may prior to the spouse's death receive or otherwise obtain the use of any income. If you don't have a trust meeting those, uh, that criteria, then you may find tax arising here. Uh, we are perhaps more familiar with spousal trusts on death and provision exists elsewhere in legislation for a rollover on death. Uh, if you're concerned with that part of it when you're writing marriage contracts, uh, keep in mind that when it's the death transfer you're concerned with, the same rules apply. That is, all of the income must uh, be paid to the surviving spouse during life and uh, capital must be frozen for the benefit of the surviving spouse. Keep in mind you also only have 36 months following death to prove that property has vested indefeasibly in that spouse. Um, whether it's by death, whether it's by indefeasible vesting, however, if you, uh, if you set up the trust properly, then you've got an automatic rollover of property into the trust, but you also have attribution back. You have attribution in the inter vivos trusts. There's no attribution, of course, with the uh, testamentary trust because I'm dead and I guess I don't care about tax at that point in time. When you are dealing with an inter vivos trust, you can, of course, elect, and the paper points out that it is possible to uh, have the trust itself pay tax, but all inter vivos trusts must pay tax at a maximum marginal rate. And unless you're in a maximum bracket, there's little advantage gained in allowing the trust to pay the tax. Uh, maximum rates, as you may know, have been running about 52 to 55 percent of late. They will in 1980. 8 be somewhere in the neighborhood of a 44 to 40, well, perhaps 44 to 60 percent, 50 percent as you go across the country here in Ontario, they'll be about 44, 45 percent, depending on what the province's uh, tax. There's not much more to be said on spousal trusts. Another topic which has been of interest over the years to all of us is the matrimonial home. Uh, both from the perspective of the Family Law Reform Act, now the Family Law Act, and from the perspective of the Income Tax Act. Under the old income tax rules, the parties could have two, or rather more than one, principal residence, one each. And consequently, the matrimonial home, one would be in the wife's name and one would be in the husband's name. That is the cottage in the home. And they would both be exempt from tax. That was then changed in keeping with the Tax Act belief that married couples are one entity uh, and married people who are cohabiting are only entitled to one principal residence. Under the Family Law Act, however, and certainly under the Family Law Reform Act, there may be more than one matrimonial home. Uh, and you need to deal with this when you're doing a marriage contract. It's not uncommon that parties who are getting married may each own a home. You will want to deal with who is going to have the ongoing principal residence designation. Are you going to live in one of the party's properties uh, and make it the principal residence, the other property then being subject to capital gains tax on disposition if there is an increase in the value? Now, with respect to the principal residence, it can be transferred again under Section 73 back and forth between the parties without any tax consequences. Uh, you can elect out, as I said earlier, because there are no tax consequences, even if you elect out because of the exemption. You want to be aware of whose name the property is in, not from the Income Tax Act perspective, only from the Family Law Act perspective. It's irrelevant to the Income Tax Department uh, whose name the property is in. There is still only one principal residence in the family. The only time that it may be of uh, importance, and certainly it is to George, uh, is if you have a spouse who's in a lower income bracket and you may want to change the designation on the home at some time, then you will want to keep it in that spouse's name alone. But I would want my marriage contract to reflect the fact that that doesn't mean if we separate and there's an increase in value that I have to go by way of constructive trust in order to get my property back. That can be a significant problem. With respect to the principal residence, we have to be aware that a principal residence is only that part which is um, inhabited by the person uh, and spouse or children, uh, plus one half a hectare, or up to one half a hectare, which George assures me is just over one acre, uh, which is necessary to the enjoyment of the property. 
So if one of the parties owns a, an apartment building and lives in one of the units, you're not going to be able to use that whole apartment building as a principal residence, nor will you necessarily be able to use a farm property, that is the whole farm property, uh, as the principal residence. Now there's a case known uh, Yates versus the Minister of National Revenue uh, in which a gentleman in Guelph uh, had purchased a property which was in excess of this and he was not able to subdivide and consequently it was found in the Federal Court of Appeal that the amount, the size of the property at the time of the purchase, uh, if there could be no subdivision, would be that which was the matrimonial home, or principal residence rather, and the, uh, Revenue Canada now operates on this Yates principle. So it, in fact, may be possible to have larger than one half a hectare uh, for your principal residence. Yates actually sold 9.3 acres, uh, sold it to the city of Guelph on the threat of expropriation, claimed an exemption on the 9.3 of the 10 acre parcel of land, and the appeal court said all principal residence. Now, having said that, and uh, with Evelyn having said that Revenue Canada is administering law on that basis, uh, I did give a uh, comment to a farmer uh, last month, a farmer who had a 22-acre parcel of land and uh, who in 1968, when he bought the property, had to buy 25 acres. A couple had acres have gone for road allowance expropriation over the years. I did say I didn't think that the whole 22 acres, if now sold, would be free of tax under the principal residence rules because I was concerned that because this person had actually farmed the land, uh, that very action would say that the excess land wasn't needed for use and enjoyment of the primary residence. And I think the next court case on this subject will deal with that issue. So I've you know, said that you've got one uh, or half a hectare. One acre. I one acre. Prefer one yeah. acre. We must make the transition, Evelyn. Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> With respect to the tax consequences that arise as a result of a marriage contract, you probably won't hear about them uh, unless there's some negligence on your part and you were unaware of them at the time you negotiated. Uh, that is, during the marriage, because the parties largely file their agreement away. However, you should be concerned, uh, number one, with section 160 sub 1 of the Act, uh, which says that the tax consequences as a result of attribution are the joint and several liability of the parties. Now, I think a lot of us have assumed that the person who is stuck with the attribution, that is, to whom the attribution attaches, is the person who is left with the tax responsibility. That is not the case any longer. Um, there is now joint and several responsibility. So. What your obligation is as a lawyer when you're dealing with the marriage contract is one, to know what the possible tax consequences are, and I don't mean in exact dollars, that's George's job, but to at least be aware that there may be a problem, one, with respect to the RRSPs, uh, two, with respect to the principal residences, three, with respect to rollovers and attributions, and at least be aware so that you can direct yourself, number one, and two, direct your client's attention they may decide that they want to negotiate around those tax consequences. The husband may not care whether the wife cashes the spousal RRSPs and he's stuck with the income. He may care. In any event, you should know who it is that has responsibility for payment of the tax. Uh, the joint and several responsibility in the Tax Act may be all right for the Tax Act, but it may not be satisfactory to one of the parties. So you will want an indemnity. Uh, you will certainly want an obligation that the person who is obtaining the benefit pay the tax. That, that would be the normal course. However, there are exceptions to that, and there may be an intention to transfer a piece of property without any tax. And if that's the case, you should at least advise your client that there may be this attribution. Uh, if he says fine or she says fine and accepts it, uh, I'd be uh, clear that in my own reporting letter that the client understood that that possibility was there so that there was not at some later time uh, a negligence problem. Okay. Those are all our tidbits for today. Anything Anyone have a question? <coughs> Sir. For deductibility of legal fees? Uh, well, the latest that I know, although I certainly didn't look at it again in directing myself at this paper, was that it was for enforcement uh, of support as opposed to the establishment of the right for support. Uh, and consequently, clients will phone you and ask you to write a letter saying, Mrs. Jones 
not was billed, but paid me $5,000 in 1986, 2,000 of which was directly attributable to the enforcement uh, of a support right. And that's, that's what clients have been asking for. That's all I know as far as deductibility is concerned. Unless there's a business, and there may be the business protecting itself may be deductible to the business. Do you have any? No, I have nothing to add. Yes? Yes, under Section 160, Sub 1 of the Act. Yes, it is. Yes. I think. Well, I suppose it depends on how you look at it. Revenue Canada will not go after both of the spouses jointly and severally. They normally go after the one to where there's attribution. However, they have a right to come after the other spouse. J okay. Just so that's clear. Uh, tax liability sticks to the person who has to recognize the income, and that's the person who has the obligation to pay the tax. Revenue will only, through Section 160, move into a transferee spouse uh, where they are giving up all hope of getting it from the transferor spouse, and the provisions are there to give them the legal enforceable right to go after the transferee spouse. So E14, in fact, isn't wrong, but strictly it is because Section 160 sub 1 is there, although they don't use it unless they have to. The section would appear to go beyond the simple at income tax on uh, simple attribution. It would uh, seem to also catch a situation where if you knew you had a huge liability, you give everything away to your spouse, uh, your, your spouse would then find uh, himself or herself liable for your tax if, if uh, less than fair market value had been paid for the property on the transfer. Okay. Yes? On transferring property pursuant to a separation agreement, what do I recommend to the solicitor for the transferee? Yes, you would want want. Well, you would want number one to say the person does not have a tax liability that they haven't fulfilled, uh, and does not have a pending tax obligation that they're aware of. Uh, that could follow that property and if they do then you would want a remedy in order to go back into the agreement. That certainly happened before that people have transferred property without asking that and there's certainly a case for possible negligence there. From the tax department? No. <laughs> They'll never tell you you don't owe tax. You they, can't, they may you change can't, their minds. You can't get them to return a phone call. So. Yeah. I think the best you can do is the indemnity from the uh, transferring spouse. Uh, on the point, too, I think if it's a principal residence you're transferring, in the simple case where there's only one home, it's being transferred, uh, I think that you should insist, if you're representing the transferee spouse, to have the designation of that as a principal residence made on the transfer. It doesn't cost the transfer or anything. The election gets filed, and then there's no way that there can be a tax liability attaching to that property in the past. Apart from following it for other tax. Apart from? Like if the person has tax liability, they can go after. Oh, a, yes. A, yeah, the property yes. under Section yeah, but 160. But not with respect to that one property. Right. Also, you'd want to look at tax returns. I mean, you'll have an idea whether the person has a, a tax liability from the prior return. You can get a statement from Revenue Canada if the person, the, the taxpayer, applies for it showing what his payments are. Uh, there's a computer printout you can get, although they're not that quick in, in providing it. And I'd also search executions because Revenue Canada will file executions. That's correct. Correct. Revenue Canada can take three years to reassess a return. Uh, three years from the date of the original assessment, that return is open and taxes may be assessed. Appeal rights exist, of course, but taxes can be assessed up to three years after. Okay, one more question. Yes. 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 That would be property substituted for property. I get cash, I buy marketable security, substituted property. 
or I put it in the bank uh, and I earn income directly from the investment of cash. Right. What I said was there's no Section 73 rollover because there's nothing happening with cash. If you move it from one place to another, there's no immediate tax consequence. And, and I raised the warning that, well, if it's foreign currency cash you're moving, there could be. George always has to come up with an exception. Thank you. But a good one. Yeah. so nice to see you. How are you, Rob? Working very well. Gentlemen, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we're moving into the marriage contract portion, or at least with an emphasis on marriage contracts for the balance of the day. As I'm sure you're aware, marriage contracts have been legal since 1978. At about that time, it was the common view that family lawyers were going to become involved uh, in a very uh, extensive way in drafting of contracts for married spouses. I think it's fair to say that that simply never materialized. In 1986, however, there were two fundamental changes in the law. Shareable assets were expanded to include virtually all assets. The legislation also attempted to severely limit the court's ability to deviate from automatic sharing. With the larger range of people affected by the act, uh, it's fair to say that there has been a substantial increase in the instances in which lawyers have been asked to assist with the drafting of uh, marriage contracts. The Globe and Mail in an article recently in Friday, September 18th's paper put it at five times the volume of contracts that lawyers were experiencing before. Also with the effect of the three cases you heard of this morning, Pellick, Richardson and Caron, it's fairly clear in my submission that marriage contracts are going to have to be drafted very carefully in order to avoid the potential of liability in that after separation agreements receive the kind of uh, strict interpretation the Supreme Court seems to be indicating, uh, marriage contracts in my submission are going to follow fairly carefully. Now later in the program we will be having a panel dealing with the issues that arise in marriage contracts and hopefully providing at least some of the answers. Uh, family lawyers are frequently heard to comment, however, in negotiating marriage contracts that the process is quite different. In, in dealing with separation agreements, I think we're familiar with the fact that there are strains between the parties, but uh, having had the experience of negotiating contracts for some years, those are experiences and strains that lawyers in this area tend to be able to deal with on a fairly regular basis. Uh, however, in negotiating marriage contracts, there are different strains. There are strains between the parties at raising the issue of a contract, strains between the lawyer and the client, and in general, it is a different process that the parties and their lawyers are going through. Uh, family practitioners are, um, are intimately aware of the emotional stages associated with negotiating separation agreements and can cope with those. But I believe that the dynamics of negotiating a marriage contract are something that we just don't know enough about. Contrary to the parties who are separating, we're dealing with two parties who don't hate each other who are working towards a common goal of life together, who are full of hope as opposed to disappointment, and who frequently see the suggestion of a contract as something that is an intrusion into their lives and something that they don't want to have to deal with. A degree of understanding of the emotional circumstances that the parties are experiencing is going to be a practical necessity in an area that is becoming increasingly more commonplace. 
With us for the next 20 minutes is Kathleen Metcalf, a noted mediator and marriage counselor in Toronto. And without further ado, uh, Ms. Metcalf. Thank you. Whenever I'm asked to speak to lawyers, it's usually about the subject of emotions. And I guess emotions are those things that interfere with the practice of law. But both lawyers and counselors or marriage counselors such as myself have to deal with human emotions, with different aspects of the human condition. And I think that lawyers as well as counselors have a sensitivity to the kind of stress that their clients are going through. When I attended the summer program at the Harvard Law School, I, heard, I was fortunate enough to hear Roger Fisher, who's written a very useful book called Getting to Yes. And he talks about formal negotiations as opposed to the everyday who's going to get the car kind of negotiations, and says that formal negotiations often take place in the context of very intense, highly charged emotions. And I think that the marriage contract would often fall into this category. I'll come back a little later in this presentation to some of the suggestions that Fisher makes about how to deal with the volatility. But I thought I might first look at what the emotions are when people are preparing to make a marriage contract. Sometimes this may take place in the context of a business. A partner may say to other partners, look, we better have all of us making marriage contracts. We don't want someone separating and one of the spouses trying to take over part of the business. You're all right, but I don't know whether I want to deal with your spouse. And if I imagine myself in that circumstance, it sounds quite logical. If my partner came to me and said, I think this is what we should do, I'd say, right, I can see the point to that. I have a little harder time imagining then going home and saying to my husband, oh, you know what, I think we should have a marriage contract. It's supposed to be a really good thing in terms of protecting my business from you. But I'm sure that we would come to an agreement. He's a sensible person and we would go off and, and do this. And yet I'm sure we would find it unsettling. There would be something a little disquieting about the very process of having to make contingency plans for our separation. I think that there are in society generally many centrifugal forces that make it hard, hard to be married. And this is bound to be yet another force for many people. What would be helpful would be if the lawyers had some kind of antidote for this. Maybe some kind of a love potion that your clients would drink just before they come and work out the fine details. I don't think there is one on the market as yet. And until that time, the function is going to have to be performed by you, the lawyers, as you sit down with your client to try and prepare for this. Somehow, it would be helpful if you can neutralize the experience to make it a, as calm and even an event for the client as, as possible, and to look at ways of making it, um, of, of sort of downplaying some of the emotions connected with it. And one way that may be helpful is simply acknowledging the awkwardness or the difficulty that the client may be having by saying things like, I know this may not be in the spirit of your marriage, or I know, this, I know you may find this difficult to do when you're not planning a separation. Just making some kind of a statement that would acknowledge the, the difficulty involved may help the client deal with the situation better. The situation of someone preparing for a first marriage is very different from the one I just described. These people tend to be young and in love. <laughs> Both very tender states, as I recall. 
And people who are both young and in love think they're going to stay young and in love forever. Well, they may stay in love forever. They certainly won't stay young forever. But it's hard for them to even imagine that this marriage of theirs is going to break down and that they should be thinking about what they ought to do if it does. It just isn't in the spirit of what they're undertaking. However, often it's their parents who are concerned that there should be a marriage contract. Their parents who are thinking about the assets that they've acquired that they don't particularly want to go to some little known fiance. We have some clients who have a daughter who actually was in law school and preparing to marry uh, or at least getting very serious about a young man who was also in law school. Now, the parents were thinking ahead, thinking, now this looks like it might be it, and feeling that they wanted their daughter to have a marriage contract. But they couldn't very well raise it before there was any engagement. This seemed a little premature. Well, the couple finally did get engaged, and there was great ceremony and happiness and the two families got together and everything was very nice. And that didn't seem to be the time to introduce this subject either. And then time went by and then it was too close to the wedding. They didn't want to just spring it right before the wedding. But they went to a lawyer who suggested a trust that would take care of some of their concerns. But that's not going to be the solution very often. And I think the point is that there never is the right time to introduce this topic. The idea of marriage that most people have when they get married is that it involves passion and commitment and trust and total involvement. And those are very different concepts from the way that a marriage contract, the basis of a marriage contract. I remember hearing a vow that probably isn't even used anymore in a marriage ceremony, but it was, with all my worldly goods I thee bestow. So I guess we've added an asterisk, except those that are identified in my marriage contract. That the total, the idea of a spiritual contract which transcends the material is, is called into question. Let's consider also those who are getting married a second time. Because for these people, even though their sense of passion and commitment may be just as strong, the idea of marriage as a deal may not be uh, unfamiliar. And they may be more accepting of the idea of a marriage contract, so that it may be a little easier to sit down and work things out. I think that sometimes the first children of people in a second marriage, those children from a previous marriage can be what is in people's minds when they want a marriage contract going into the second marriage. They want to protect some of their assets for their children, not for their fiancé's children. And certainly the impact of children on second marriages can turn fairly uh, ordinary families into boiling cauldrons of disappointment, resentment, jealousy, etc. So that that whole issue of managing children within a second marriage can be a very, very volatile one. Something else which can make this contract difficult is when there's clearly a, quite a, an inequality between the assets owned by the two spouses. Now this doesn't tend to be quite as much of a problem when it's a woman marrying a wealthy man. We think this is good luck for her and hope she enjoys it and that society sort of accepts this. However, when it's a man with less income marrying a wealthy woman, this presents greater difficulties. Somehow within our social 
memories, we have ingrained the idea that man is the provider, even though today most women are providers as well. But a man marrying a woman with a lot more money may be afraid of being seen as a hanger-on or a gigolo and be very touchy and sensitive about the whole issue. Recently we had some, uh, well, also um, to, to identify, does the man say, I have a cottage in Muskoka, or does he say, we have a cottage in Muskoka? And recently we had a client who opted for the we have a cottage in Muskoka line, whereupon his 11-year-old stepson said, you don't have a cottage in Muskoka, that cottage belongs to my mother. Now, the fact that this was literally true didn't do too much to ease the family tensions. There's another uh, circumstance in which a marriage contract comes into play that may be a bit unusual, but is one that we've seen in our practice. The Family Law Act attempts to equalize the positions of the husband and wife upon separation, the financial positions. It doesn't do anything for people that are married. And if you imagine a woman who's married to a wealthy man who feels that she's treated uh, as an unequal partner in this marriage. She doesn't know what her husband's finances are. Her spending power is limited, although it, she has the impression there's a lot of money around somewhere. If that marriage isn't going too well, she may think of separating, not only as a way, way to get out of the marriage, but as a way to get a hold of what's actually going on. Financial disclosure may give her a much better understanding of where things are at. And she may go into a separation with the, eye, with the hope, perhaps, if she hasn't given up on this man, with the hope that if the separation can be worked out decently, if she can gain some respect from her husband and be treated differently, that she'll change that separation agreement into a marriage contract. To look at the, the common themes of negotiating a marriage contract, it seems that conflicting emotions may often be present, may often be something that the lawyer is going to need, need to deal with. When we go to an estate lawyer, we at least know we're going to die, even if we hope it's later rather than sooner. When we want to do, make a marriage contract, we're making contingency plans for something that we both hope won't happen and indeed in some religions must not happen. One way of at least making sure that uh, you're not causing problems, unnecessary problems, is to make sure that there's enough time for the client to consider the marriage contract, for the other, for the fiance to consider it, for both to get independent legal advice, to think about it so that they're not being presented with this thing five days before the wedding and the wedding will be called off if it doesn't get signed. This may be an effective way of getting it signed, but after the honeymoon and everything comes back down to earth, it's going, it can lead to a lot of problems in the marriage and in fact make it more likely that the marriage contract is going to be used. Roger Fisher, whom I mentioned earlier, talks about making things more objective as a way of handling some of the difficult emotions. To yourselves look at a, at a fairly objective way to present to your clients the need for a marriage contract, and then perhaps helping your client to present it to their fiance, if this is indeed a pre-marriage situation. Going over the words that he or she is going to use and being clear about the goals. Ross mentioned when we were discussing this presentation earlier that a client of his had asked him to write a letter advising that he have a marriage contract, explaining what it was, telling how you could go about getting one so that the game of blame it on your lawyer could be played in a, in a fairly constructive way. But if, and also, if the goals are clear, it may be easier to generate different alternatives, different options as to how it's going to be drawn up 
that some ways of achieving something may be just less objectionable than others and get to the same goal. It's possible also to sit down with both lawyers and both clients because we assume if this is before a marriage that there is not too much antagonism. It may also be possible to use another lawyer as, in fact, a mediator, to have a mediator lawyer sit down with both clients and at the same time have independent lawyers for each of the parties involved. However it's done, the essential thing is going to be, I think, the lawyer's sensitivity to the importance of the marriage to the client sensitivity to the importance of the marriage and respect for the marriage so that the marriage contact contract is drawn up in a context that doesn't take away from the hope and aspirations of the marriage. If we're going on a trip we might get um, overseas health insurance but this doesn't take away from our excitement about the trip and our ability to enjoy the places that we're going to. We also can expect, I think, that as people who have grown up in an age of divorce tend to be more the people who are marrying, they may be more understanding of the need for a marriage contract and find it less offensive. But it's still going to come down to that conversation between the lawyer and the client and the lawyer's support and encouragement and objectivity can be very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Thank Kathleen. You. We're going to move to our panel now as soon as... Thank you. We'll be moving to our panel now as soon as we can find participants. I'd like to, uh, just before we get going, um, someone in the audience, I'm sorry I can't recall who it was, came up and asked a very interesting question um, dealing with Canada Pension Plan. Um, and w I think we have to modify uh, what you heard from Phil Epstein and what you heard from myself slightly. Um, there is no doubt about it, we'll go step at a time here, but it's, it is important, um, that a general release will not necessarily be effective. In other words, it does not bind the minister. That much we know for sure. And so if you have done separation agreements since June of 86, this isn't June of this year, it's a year and a, year and a bit ago, you can't count on the validity of that general release clause. The next step is this, that if you're doing any contracts after that date, and all the ones you've done to date, you must identify by section number and act as we discussed this morning if it is to be valid with one further proviso that there we're still awaiting some provincial legislation to validate the ability to do that and it's 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 contained in a further subsection so where does that leave us it leaves us that you have to uh, be very cautious in the area you have to tell clients that they can try and get releases and to get releases you have to identify the act and the section number and the intention of the parties to release their rights and then we're still waiting for some provincial legislation, probably by way of an amendment to the Family Law Act, that will permit uh, the ability to uh, provide such releases. So thank you for whoever it was in the audience who, who uh, the problem arose, there was a, ty a typo in the CCH service in uh, what the wording of the act is. And in fact, 
it does say we require provincial enabling legislation to make this valid. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. This part of the program will be 15 minutes longer than in your brochure. The second part will be 15 minutes shorter. The first question I'd like to direct to Ruth Mesber, uh, especially listening to George talk about tax uh, implications, but in, in general, there seems to be an insecurity amongst practitioners in this field that uh, who are being asked to deal with the marriage contracts, presumably because of the, the wide-ranging uh, effect that the contracts have and the fact that their effects may not be known for, for many, many years. Uh, do you have any suggestions how we might approach negotiations in this area to try to reduce or contain some of this insecurity? Well, as, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, no? No? Is this working? Yes, no? That. Better? Um, I think there are two aspects of insecurity. One is the insecurity of the clients themselves, and I have some suggestions of how to deal with that, and also our own insecurity about these kinds of contracts and what they mean to us, and I don't know if I can be particularly helpful on that side. My own personal feeling is that all of uh, these contracts are probably going to turn to dirt in about 10 years, and we're all going to be sued hither and yon by our clients. But as far as the clients are concerned, from, from the dynamics point of view, the dynamics of the negotiation, some things that I found helpful are to focus the client at the outset on what it is specifically that they want to accomplish in the contract. Why have you come to see me? What is it that you want to do in this contract? And you may find that it is one very specific item that the parties want to cover off in a contract and you can then focus on that and limit your contract to that. Another thing which I found extremely helpful is a four-way meeting at the very beginning. To sit down, the four of you, usually the parties on one side of the table holding hands and the lawyers on the other side, to talk in a, a think tank kind of way as to what it is you want to accomplish, what about the downside? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about what might happen if you do thus and so in the agreement? And I find that a meeting like that can often begin to formulate a skeleton of a contract that's very helpful. What gets my back up is to see a client for the first time and have him or her come in with a draft from the other side before anybody's talked to me, before there's been any negotiation at all. And it sets a climate of take it or leave it, whether intended or otherwise, that I think is very unhealthy. Um, my philosophy in these things is that each side goes to the bargaining table with a list of goals as to what he or she wants out of the deal. And our job is to see that as many of those goals get met on both sides. And I think if you focus the negotiation that way, it can be fairly productive. Steve Smart, um, we know that you can have a marriage contract that takes effect on separation or death. Uh, is it necessary to cover both eventualities in a contract? I think um, the death situation is perhaps the uh, most clearly area, or, or the biggest area where people do not direct their minds. Clients come into you with a very clear idea of what they want in a marriage contract, and they have never thought of the death situation. The act is very clear uh, that one can enter into a marriage contract that deals with both situations. It's an issue that must be addressed, must be brought forward in the early stages because how you develop your contract flows as to whether it's to cover this other area of death or not. Um, some clients have very strong feelings. Well, we only want a contract to govern if we split it up. I don't care what happens in death. Uh, other, cli other clients, of course, depending on uh, the uh, size of a state we're concerned on, have very strong views the other way. Uh, very often it's becoming a common practice to, to define marriage breakdown as including death, and that's the way you trigger the mechanism so that the contract really operates in the event of the normal traditional marriage breakdown, breakdown separation or divorce, or in the event of the death of the first party. Uh, I think, speaking, uh, one of the objectives surely is to uh, satisfy uh, the parties that they may get at least what they would be entitled to um, 
on death as if they were separating. And of course, that's the whole family law section four and five mechanism. But in terms of a marriage contract, uh, very often that's in fact what parties wish uh, to confirm. Uh, one of the clauses that is common to put in is to make sure that parties will have uh, will covenant with each other to at all times have a valid last will and testament providing at least for the benefits provided for in this in their last will and testament and that this covenant is binding on their estates. Um, I think the whole area invites the question uh, again depending on the complexity of the situation of uh, touching base and obtaining input from an estate lawyer. I think. Uh, some uh, of us who practice so tightly in the family law area uh, can do well to benefit from seeking advice from uh, uh, an estate lawyer uh, because of the issues that uh, are germane to that practice. I think another a situation in the death situation that uh, is very common, you have a, a second marriage and the only asset really is the house. and. Uh, the husband wants to uh, protect that house for his children from his first marriage, but he wants in the contract to guarantee that wife number two at least has the right to uh, elect to stay in the house at her option until her death. And in that, in that situation, that's a very simple example of uh, dealing with the death situation in a uh, positive and constructive way. In an attempt to try to make this uh, rather complex subject a little more understandable, we're going to approach the drafting of separation, sorry, of marriage contracts by dealing with the specific situations in which they most frequently arise. Uh, Ruth, one of the most common situations is one in which one of the spouses brings the matrimonial home into the relationship and does not want to share the entire equity. Do you have any suggestions as to how uh, you might approach that particular problem? There are a lot of ways of dealing with it. Um, and what I find in marriage contracts particularly is that there is generally a lot of quite original thought required with each situation because they tend not to be the same in the way that separation agreements are the same. So that precedents are not particularly useful apart from the arounds, if you will, the start and the end, but the guts of the agreement, I think you're going to have to come to grips with drafting a lot of it yourselves. You'll find on page F45 and following some suggestions, all of which were tailor-made to particular situations. But one of the things that you can do is to fix the value, for example, of the equity in the matrimonial home at the date of the marriage and to provide that on marriage breakdown. The spouse that came in with that asset will always be given a credit for that amount of money regardless of the fact that it was contained within the matrimonial home. You may want to provide, the person who owns the house may say, yeah, but uh, my equity today is worth $50,000. Suppose that we separate 15 years from now, $50,000 isn't worth very much. Um, you may want to consider having the initial equity be expressed in constant 1987 dollars, that is to apply a cost of living escalator to that amount so that 15 years from now he or she will come out with $50,000 as indexed in accordance with the cost of living. Um, you may want to say that the proportion of the equity in the house that that $50,000 represents will be the proportion of the equity that he or she will get out at the other end. Let's say that at the outset the house is worth $100,000 and there's equity of $50,000, you may say, spouse who brings it in on marriage breakdown will get 50% of the net proceeds of sale. Um, you may want to deal specifically with certain financing. Let's say that before the marriage, the other spouse or spouse-to-be has co-signed on a mortgage or has lent money towards the purchase price you may wish to provide that that will be secured by way of a mortgage on the property and be paid out on the sale of the property down to the other end. Um, buyout provisions, uh, I made some comments about that this morning about the ways of calculating a buyout price, for example. You may want to provide that he or she who <coughs> owned the property at the outset will have the option of buying out the other spouse's interest on marriage breakdown and you can create formulas for doing that. 
the, the range is really limitless and um, you can be quite imaginative and creative in terms of how you deal with the issue. Stephen Grant, how do you treat notional legal fees, legal fees and commissions on a buyout if you're uh, involved in one? Well, the, the, the question is this. Do you allow for a uh, notional reduction in the uh, amount that one spouse will pay to the other to purchase the other's uh, interest? And I suppose the answer to that question depends who you act for. And uh, if you're acting for uh, the purchaser, you may very well want to include a notional reduction for real estate commission and legal fees and if you're acting for the uh, vendor you may not want to I think it really or you may want to saw it in half I, th I think one of the fair things to do perhaps is to call it a three percent uh, notional notional deduction for real estate commission and legal fees and leave it at that uh, Ruth do you deal with substituted properties as a rule in a marriage contract dealing with a matrimonial home well I think it's very important that you do and one of the problems is, and I think we're still very caught up in thinking of the Family Law Reform Act, where we think about sharing assets on marriage breakdown. And of course, that doesn't happen. We don't share property at all on marriage breakdown now under the FLA. What we are sharing is value. So that in a sense, what you want to do is not exempt the specific property from sharing. This is my personal view, but you want to exempt a certain value from coming into the calculation of net family property. And that's very different conceptually than saying that this house will be excluded from net family property. Because if you say this house, what invariably happens is the couple thinks this is our dream house forever and ever, and they draw this contract that deals with 123 Main Street, and you have all sorts of formulas and everything else. And then they go and they sell the house and they buy another one and your contract hasn't anticipated that, it hasn't said anything about that. And I have seen situations where that has happened and you're back to square one, you're back to the Family Law Act with your substituted property. And I think that it comes back to what I said before about focusing on what it is that you want to accomplish and if what it is that you want to accomplish is to exclude the value of what you are bringing in from any eventual sharing, then that's what you should say. And you don't then run into the problem of substituted properties or it's, it's sold and a new one and then a new one and so on if you simply talk about the value that's being brought in. One of the other situations where marriage contracts are being asked for is in cases where the parties have lived separate and apart for a period of time and want to give their relationship another chance. Uh, one also fairly common situation is where the wife or the wife and children in such a situation will be in possession of the home and ask uh, whether or not there is some way they can ensure that if the reconciliation doesn't work out that they can have the other spouse leave the home. Uh, Steve Smart, is there any way of drafting a clause that will achieve that goal? No, unfortunately, uh, there seems to be uh, no ability to cover this point uh, with any sureness. Um, this may seem unfair in the situation where wife and children are in possession of the home and, uh, you know, as a last-ditch effort, she's going to patch the marriage and uh, let hubby back in. Uh, and it might be very reasonable for her to expect that she should uh, have the right to have possession of the home in the event that this uh, last effort fails. Uh, but. Uh, this wife would be in the same category as any uh, spouse. Part two of the act is very clear that in, by way of contract, we cannot with any surety uh, deal with the issues of exclusive possession of the home so that if they do separate, any provision may very well be